What's up fellow gamers, Freak here, and patch 13.9 is coming or has already arrived to a server near you. Uh, this is a solo queue only patch, MSI is already going on, uh, I watched the first day's games already, and uh, yeah, that's been fun, but either way, this is a solo queue focus patch. Uh, Mid-season is coming in 13.10, for those of you who have had your eyes glued to Twitter or Reddit, uh, a lot of those changes are already up on the PvE and you can scope those out. Uh, sometime later this week, I will put out a video about uh, the stuff that I sort of took lead on, I guess. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Different video, though. This is going to be about 13.9, solo key patch coming near us, and it should be all very, very fun. Again, a bit of light aside because we are doing mid-season stuff. Um, Nico Midscope is the really big thing here. Definitely really, really exciting. Uh, so, all right, let's move forward. Quick rundown on what's going on here. Nerfs to Jinx and Scion, buffs to Aatrox, Bimu, Swain, Trundle, and Volibear. Belveth and Kale getting some meaningful adjustments, as is Nico, as is Talia. Um, to be fair, Talia is strictly buffed, as far as I know. Uh, a quick item buff to Lich Bay, which is kind of an underperforming item, and some new skins. And we'll do individual context for each one when we get to it. So first up, Nico update, and I think it's really, really awesome. I like this a ton. Um, I think this is this is really cool, really compelling. Uh, TLDR, the big thing is that you can now. Uh, disguise yourself as any non-epic monster, as a minion, as a trap, as a ward, or as a plant. Um, as long as it has a health bar and can be right-clicked functionally, um, you can go after it. So yeah, okay, not turrets, but uh, this means if you're the fourth caster minion in the wave, uh, this means if you choose to uh, take your disguise as a cannon minion and then come in with a non-cannon wave, people aren't going to realize it. You show up as a cannon minion. If you've got Elise or Ivern on your team, you can be a Spiderling or Daisy. Uh, there are lots of ways to be um, very, very disguised. It's really cool. It's really interesting. Um, honestly, I haven't personally played any of Nico rework, but uh, I have been in a lot of play tests with her, and it has been chaos in the best way. I am super stoked for this. It is super duper awesome. Uh, really happy this is happening. Uh, some rules changes around disguise breaking. Uh, no longer breaks on taking damage, so you can, in fact, be a stealth ward, um, and, you know, they can hit you, and if you stand still, that they can hit you up to three times before your would-be ward body would die, and then you can break out, but um, allows you to Again, right, only when the disguise self would have died. Or again, on taking crowd control. Um, I believe also, for what it's worth, if you auto-attack a turret, I believe it'll also break here. Uh, this might not be the patch notes, but I believe this was at least discussed, and I, I think this is what uh, Flox wanted to do. Uh, <clears throat> you don't get free attack speed from switching over. So like a, there's a bunch of, like, random edge case stuff going away, but ultimately, um, it is much more usable, right? Super short cooldown. You can disguise pretty constantly, and this just... It's actually quite awesome. This is a really, really cool set of changes. Uh, there are some stuff moving around um, around it, of course. So um, lower base damage, higher ratio on Q. This is on the secondary and tertiary pop. Uh, the AoE is a bit larger, though, which is kind of nice. And it now does more damage to jungle monsters. So we can talk about that when it comes down to the numbers things. Um, and now it, play, it now just casts it maximum. If you cast it long range, I think it's actually very appropriate as well. So that's just a good change overall. Uh, Shape Splitter. Uh, you can now repress W to move your clone around and, and juke. Uh, the same kind of stuff you can do with Shaco and LeBlanc passive. Uh, the clone now will play animations. So if you want to like send out the clone and then channel recall, um, you know, you will have a clone channeling recall in the middle of the lane and you potentially juke people and Nautilus goes and throws a hook at you and it's like, just kidding, that was a clone, I juked. Like, there's some really, really cool stuff here that's uh, really, really awesome. Um, I mean, in general, I'm pretty sure it's just always correct if you're going to take a recall as Nico to W in front of you and then recall. Um, this way, if someone likes to rise with their charm or, again, Nautilus hook or whatever, it just gets blocked by your clone. Um, there's some pretty free stuff there that's pretty useful. Uh, and the fact that there's actually a lot more gameplay around um, disguising intelligently and using stuff with your clones is actually a really, really big deal. Uh, Nico, to my recollection, is the only champion in the game that lost win rate from day zero to day one. Uh, that her skill expression was so flat um, that it was actually eclipsed by other people that were against her learning about, oh, she can disguise, I shouldn't be confused so often. Uh, only champion I know of where the playing as experience actually grew sh more sharply, more quickly than the playing as experience of the champion. Um, only champion would have done that. Uh, I know that there is a lot more skill expression around doing really cool design, like disguise tech. Like this is honestly quite skillful um, around clone manipulation. Really cool stuff here. Also of note is that, um, oh, once again, there's another jungle mon here. Um, whenever W pops, you do bonus damage to monsters. That's gonna be pretty valuable there as well. Uh, once again, Lower base, higher ratio on Tangle Barbs. Update to Pop Blossom is uh, 
a, a longer cooldown uh, for ranks 1 through 2. Uh, magic damage is certainly down by 50 to 100. Lower ratio here as well for its worth, so it, it's less damage on R, um, no shielding on R. However, um, the ultimate now has a, a small knockup and then a stun. Um, this is timed such that if you catch someone on the very, very, very edge of the R, um, and then you throw a, an E, um, if they have zero tenacity, you will hit confirm the R into the E. Uh, if they have um, pretty much any tenacity uh, on the edge, they can then flash to get out of the way in time, or spell shield if they're silver or whatever. Uh, basically, there is a knockup that then guarantees the, the, knock, the, the, the slam down comes in, so the damage functionally happens sooner, because they can't get the rest of the way out of the circle, but you don't get the self shield, all that other stuff. Either way, um, this has felt pretty good and pretty satisfying. I think this is overall a good change to the spell, so glad that it's happening. So flashbang warning, let's get into the numbers. Okay, so here is Nico's full Q damage before and after. This is approximating a decent amount of ability power. This is a stat shard plus a Doran's Ring to start the lane. And then assuming you get, you know, to some amount of ability power on, like, a level 4 recall. Of course, if you're going to do, like, only level 6 or level 7 or level 8 recall for uh, bigger items, you're not going to get this AP growth that you're, you know, expecting into here. But this is assuming that you're functionally pro rating ability power at any point in time. And pretty quickly, it just simply does more damage. You're not losing a lot. Um, there is a chance I'm doing the math wrong here. I don't believe that is true. Um, so, ultimately... It does a bit more damage overall because ability power eventually takes over as what's valuable. Uh, next thing here is the actual full Q damage to monsters, which is just simply in a better spot overall. Um, yeah, not much to say except that this is going to be um, a, a really big improvement to jungle clear. She has a spell that does 200 damage to monsters at level 1. Um, now, to be fair, this is actually fraudulent. It shouldn't be 24 ability power in this case because there's no Doran's Ring. So the AP would be slightly lower. It's not quite as green. I just didn't redo the numbers. It's my mistake, but it's, you know, directionally all going to be the same stuff here. Certainly a lot better at jungling here as a champion. Next up is her auto tech DPS with W learned. Um, before, her auto tech DPS was somewhere like this. This is when W acts last, which I'm... Maybe an on-hit Nico build is going to max this earlier on, uh, but even for like a generic AP Nico, you probably still max this one last. Uh, I believe that's true. I actually didn't really double check, but again, the first few levels are what matters anyway. First seven levels, it doesn't matter if you're maxing it first, second, or third. Oh, sorry, second or third. Obviously, you max it first to be different, but um, regardless, um, this is the uh, W DPS, uh, D DPS to monsters, including W just from auto-attacking, and it's up pretty substantially around 20%, so... Um, much more damage in the Q, much more damage in your auto-attack DPS. This is again, counting her base AD um, overall, clearly more damage. Uh, and then next thing is just the E change. Um, e lost more damage, uh, more flat damage compared to its ratio. So um, actually likely overall nerf as a skill. Uh, first 12 levels being a weaker skill means it's a weaker skill. Uh, this is fine. She has plenty of other stuff going on, but just kind of noting the numbers here. Then we can look at the R cooldown again, um, longer cooldown until level 16, so that is of course a strict nerf. Uh, the amount of damage coming out here down by about a quarter as well, which is also of course a strict nerf. Um, not a huge deal, again, this champion seems really, really cool, but hey, by the way, those are the numbers. Aatrox gets some simple buffs. Um, we are trying pretty hard not to give him his sustain back, that is one thing that we're pretty much considering a non-starter. Um, there was a big healing pass done earlier on in the year. Um, I think that was useful. We took a lot of learnings from it. We cut healing in the place we thought it was most appropriate to. And as we give Aatrox some power back, because he got nerfed for pro pretty hard, uh, we, by the way, did choose to take these buffs in this patch and not in 13.8. He was already incredibly high prio for worlds. We decided we didn't want to have two tournaments in a row with a chance at Aatrox approaching 100% pick bans. We said, look, Sorry it's under two weeks of Aatrox not being in a very good spot, but have your buffs a little bit later. Um, Aatrox is, I believe, quite um, high MR skew, which means he tends to be laning phase skewed. I think most of the buffs we've seen Aatrox get over the course of this year have been late game focused. I think that is a good thing. Um, flattening out Aatrox's power level. I mean, to me, it, like, it feels bad when, as a player, and even if you're like in the top third, right? You're like high gold. You're in the top like 30% of players. Um... And it's like, oh, I can't, I, I I have to master my champion more than other people to master their champions in order to get the same win rate as them because my, my champ is nerfed for pro. It is something that feels pretty bad and I think um, it's something that can turn off um, quite a few players uh, from what would otherwise be a favorite champion of theirs. So I am usually a fan of trying to uh, get rid of some elo skew when possible. Uh, and tweaking things like early versus late game power is a way to do that. Um, there are caveats to that. There are downsides to having that approach too frequently. Um, but I'm still a fan of going that way in general. I would rather, you know, get rid of skew more than exacerbate it on average. But again, there's probably a very good case where it shouldn't be the case. This could be a mastery requirement. This could be um, other things. Regardless, um, hey, Aatrox, 
has a really, really hard time in, in submasters uh, functionally, and late game focus buffs tend to disproportionately affect submasters compared to uh, the elite tiers. So anyway, um, some late game damage, and it is also some healing on uh, the passive, and then uh, arguably tweaked towards late game very, very lightly, um, a buff on World Ender here as well. So once again, we can look at the numbers here. Uh, this is the amount of total damage that'll come out of Aatrox, assuming he has no bonus AD, and his target has no bonus HP. Um, in the real world, obviously, this gets pulled in both directions by the more attack damage Aatrox buys and the tankier his target is, but honestly, an overall pretty large amount of damage for the stab, so pretty good stuff there. Uh, his total move speed during the ultimate is up, again, about 7 to 10%. Now, this is assuming that you are not running into um, the move speed cap, which does exist and will actually lower your move speed below this number. But if you are, for example, hit by a 50% slow or something, maybe like Singe throws W down, um, then you will have this percentage be actually quite accurate um, before and after. So, hey, something there. But um, either way, right, moves faster, a lot more damage in late game stabs, uh, you know, relying on the passive auto attack uh, being a more important part of the combo. Overall, cool stuff to Aatrox. Nothing much to talk about here. I think it's just good that he's getting a buff. Next is Amumu. I talked about uh, trying to close in the MMR gap. Um, I think Amumu is a champion that definitely does sort of state pretty clearly that he is a beginner jungler. Um, he's mechanically pretty easy to play. Yeah, he has a skill shot to land, but everything else is pretty much auto-targeted. You literally only have to aim one thing on the kit. Um, his jungle clear is relatively safe because of how powerful the E is. Uh, people have intuited pretty well they should be maxing E first um, for the most part. And I think it's really important that um, we actually... Uh, I, I think League of Legends as a game, I think it's important that it has... Um, maybe I'll just... I'll make up a number... I haven't given it a lot of thought here, but I think it's important. Like, it's about two champions per role that are, like, very, very easy to play, very straightforward, where even if you don't know how the role works, you can succeed in, like, its baseline requirements. Uh, and so a champion like Garen or a champion like Amumu um, are really solid beginner champions. Um, now, not to say that these champs can't have skill expression. Like, I want to I wanna kind of break apart two things here. Um, so there is new player experience, and there is low ranked ranked player experience right so pretty much the only data that you ever see on the internet is low to high mmr um ranked play information oh here's a mumu he's low elo skewed oh here's yumi she has a really high mastery curve oh here's nidalee she's really elite skewed whatever right and that's accurate for ranked play which is a subset of players that are hardcore enough to play ranked League of Legends. Um, also, they have to have played enough League of Legends to unlock ranked in the first place. And they also have to be a player that has unlocked the champion they're playing in ranked, um, which can have its own even small biases, right? Like higher blue essence cost champions, theoretically, uh, can be, you know, higher account level skewed because they can actually unlock the 6,000 blue essence champion compared to a Mumu who is easy to unlock Garen, etc. There's those kind of things slightly, very, very, very lightly exist um, as new accounts do exist and new players sign up to play League of Legends every day. Um, there is a different set of players that I pretty much promise y'all haven't thought of very much, but it's like, I just installed League of Legends. I'm going to go play with my friends. And they told me, oh, hey, we'll, we'll play bot lane together. You should just play Janna. Uh, or Yumi or whatever, or, oh, yeah, you can jungle here, go play Amumu, or you can play top lane here, go play Garen, um, or they're playing without friends, and it's like, welcome to League of Legends, would you like to play some bot games? And it's like, we recommend you play Garen or Amumu or something, and these champions will be successful on your first time playing League, um, or, you know, your first 10 games playing League, or, you know, your, your first time playing this role um, in the game. I think it is very important that those kinds of champions um, exist and, and work well. And so I'm going to use Garen as an example of a champion who I think um, does a lot of really good things. Um, so he is easy to get into, right? Um, there are no skill shots. Everything is melee range. Um, R is a really obvious, awesome ultimate with a really obvious case of kill the guy you're hitting. It's really hard for R to feel bad. If you are able to read a tooltip, it'll tell you, hey, there's a context around where you should cast this ability because it is missing health damage. And it like teaches you, oh, my abilities, I shouldn't just you know, keyboard cat, I should think about when I use my most important ability. That's really cool. Um, it also teaches you to last hit because Garen, Garen W passive gives you free stats per last hit up to a cap. And so it teaches you the last hitting is good. Um, I I know of multiple players who didn't realize last hitting was an important thing because there are tutorials and whatnot, but like there are so many mechanics in League of Legends, it can be hard to learn all of them. Um, and anyway, this is all circling back to... Um, Though Garen is a really good introductory champion, Garen also has ways to express skill. Uh, the timing on his W, for example, um, 
you know, like uh, Master Yi is another one where you can choose where you go out with Q, and you can like play Master Yi to a pretty default situation where um, you know you don't need to know that W is an attack reset, or you don't need to time W to block the big nuke. Uh, you can just sort of meditate to heal between camps, and that's actually not a bad thing, really. And you press Q on the guy, and you deal a bunch of damage, and you press E and R, and you right click the guy, and you deal a bunch of damage, and it's like, hey. Here's a straightforward champion who also, by the way, has some really tight timing mechanical outplay abilities in the Q and the W. And so you can sometimes have a cake and eat it too, where you have champions like Garen or Master Yi that are easy to play for brand new players to League of Legends, but also have enough skill expression that for relatively experienced ranked players, you can make up for the ease of play with some um, uh, like heightened requirements uh, and, and ability to outplay, and you can kind of, you can have both a very good for brand new players, but also maintain ELO skew. So like, that's really valuable and a really good thing to have. So this also goes back to Amumu. Hopefully I made the, the sort of point clear around, um, there's a brand new player like Axis, as well as a ranked Axis. So Amumu is of course low ELO skew as a champion. Um, like he does much, much better in bronze, silver, gold than he does in plat, diamond, masters. Um, he's also a relatively good brand new player champion and i would like to honestly heighten his ability to be good as a brand new player champion it's like no really you will crush the jungle no problem um your flat magic damage on w is even higher you have substantial dps increase on your early camps here with the w um it's it's going to be fine you're gonna be okay you're gonna get through the jungle don't worry about it you're gonna you're not gonna min max correctly you're not gonna queue over camps you're gonna walk between things and sit there auto attacking with your w on you're gonna forget to press e as often as you're meant to because you don't realize it comes back that fast when fighting raptors um that's okay you can just turn on W and you'll get through the jungle. Um, I think this is really valuable for making your, your first time playing jungle um, relatively lenient. Um, this also has the very, very light uh, benefit of, hey, this change um, is arguably slightly high elo skewed because um, clearing through your first jungle, maybe you can get through the camp before you get invaded by the Lee Sin or the Graves. Um, and, and your early jungle clear speed and early jungle safety is a little bit more important in high elo than in low, where invades are just less likely to be successful and less likely to be done in the first place. So um, I certainly think there's more room to try to add some tight timing skill expression to a Mumu. Um, if there's ever a good idea, that's great, but uh, definitely really important that this champion is is really good for brand new junglers, brand new League of Legends players. Uh, and so that is kind of what informed the buffs here. Uh, overall, just giving him a bit of win rate because, hey, this is a champion where I think his win rate can rest relatively high in low MMRs um, without being offensive overall. And and so here's a buff that uh, very lightly taps down his elo skew, but also I think continues to make sure that he is very good in the hands of brand new players. So let's go ahead and switch over at the numbers and talk about it here. So this is the WDPS, assuming you're hitting an enemy champion. Um, since the damage is going from, uh, the, the flat damage is going like this, and then the percent health damage, of course, is still 1% at the first rank. Uh, this is the math. Uh, at the very, very end of the game, of course, uh, hitting a relatively high health champion, 2,400 HP, um, even though you're doing another 0.4% max HP, the eight damage per tick that you're losing kind of roughly flattens out. Uh, mathematically, this means you definitely should max W last. This means there is there is really no choice now but to do E max into Q max. Um, it is clearly better in this case because keep in mind, right, getting 0.1% max health is less important early on um, than it is later on when champions have more health under their belts in the first place. So uh, definitely maxing W last. I think that is totally fine. I think that is a good place for the champion to go. Um, I think overall good stuff. And I mean, I'm, I'm personally happy with the, with the shape being like this for what the W damage is going to be. Um, I think it's just kind of correct overall for the champion. And again, should be in a totally good spot overall. And as people scale and you're fighting a Cho'Gath or a Scion, hey, uh, W is doing its important thing, right? Um, a... a larger portion of W's damage itself is actually coming from percent health damage, right? Because 20 of this is from the flat. And so at around here, finally half the damage is coming from percent health damage, right? Um, and so to me, making the percent health damage actually a meaningful portion of the power budget is, is valuable, is important. I think it's a decent just making stuff up on the fly that, hey, probably if ability has flat and percent health damage, it should probably be about half and half. Like, if they both exist in the tooltip, it should probably be roughly equal between the two. To me, that would make sense. Um, and so, yeah, this is, you know, roughly true as a result of that. There you go. It's, it's a really small change, but that was the logic behind it and, and why I chose the tactics that I did.
Uh, next is Belveth. Uh, this is kind of an experiential change because it feels pretty bad to clear the first jungle on Belveth. I'm not much of a Belveth player myself. I was just trying to trust what people are saying around me. Um, her win rate's not bad by any means. She doesn't really need buffs per se. Uh, and so basically just looked for a small nerf that people weren't going to feel too hard, but would kind of make up for this change and keep the win rate relatively flat. And that's 0.2 attack damage growth. Um, not the first time this patch. Well, okay. It's one of the few times this patch we're using um, a little bit of attack damage growth as a as a light tap down in power. Um, and so here we go. This is just simply uh, Belveth's base AD before and after. It's not a huge difference, right? It is just something. Um, I'm pretty sure pretty much all of her damage abilities use total AD as part of the factor. Uh, so that's there. You're just going to have some impact here. This is uh, even counting for the AD changes. Here is how much damage Q deals to monsters. Uh, of course, earlier on in the late game compared to late... Uh, sorry, early... Uh, more in the early game compared to late game as uh, the AD growth would kick in and, and nerf it slightly. Um, of course, the more AD you actually buy in the game, you build a Kraken series, you build whatever else, you're going to make up some of this um, because this isn't going to do as much heavy lifting anymore. Uh, but either way, right, slightly faster jungle clear. Um, even though I know that the AOE camps are not the hard part of the clear, you're still doing 15 more damage four times to things like red buff, uh, and so you're saving an auto attack on that, which is pretty useful. You can press E a little bit sooner so that you can just clear that camp a bit more quickly. You're saving about a second um, every single time you've got uh, your four Qs up, which is like not bad. You're going to save several seconds in your first clear, uh, and then a little bit on your next clear, and, and so on and so on, and that's pretty useful. So cool stuff to Belveth. Congratulations. You do a bit more damage. Um, and of course, as you put more ranks into it, um, the difference becomes 18. Uh, over here, the difference becomes 20, uh, and hey, so a little bit nicer. Okay, cool. Next is Jinx. This is just intentionally a pretty small tap down. Uh, worth noting that this amount of attack damage growth is about the same amount of power as the amount of attack speed growth she got a few patches ago. Uh, so, you know, in functional terms, the only changes between uh, Jinx from 13.4 <clears throat> and now is um, Zap has a lower mana cost and slows a bit more, which is like not, not a buff, of course. Uh, but it's just, I, I've, I've seen the Reddit comments of like, XD isn't really a nerf, and it's like, well, one, Jinx isn't that overpowered. She's like a bit strong, um, and so she's getting a small nerf. She'll still be kind of strong. She'll be above 50%. That's okay. She's relatively easy to play. Um, I, I believe Jinx is one of the higher depth marksmen. People who play Jinx play a lot of Jinx. And she, not only is she relatively high depth, she's also relatively easy to play. And when champions like Aphelios and Callista exist in all MMRs and are much harder to play, um, the average champion it must be above 50% because Zeri and Lucian and um, uh, Callista and Aphelios all exist. And certainly on the other side, there's Neela and Vagar and Karthus and Swain, but they are less popular than, than these four. Uh, and so, like, literally the average marksman like, the average power level of a marksman, their win rate will rest above 50 because those other champions are, are more popular. As Ezreal and Caitlyn and all... Like, there are a lot of very popular champions who sit below 50 and that literally raise the baseline win rate of other champions. Uh, so Jinx is, like, maybe, like, 1% win rate over or something. And it's like, oh, no, she'll be, like, 0.5% win rate over. I Somehow Reddit has convinced themselves this is a huge problem. And I, it, it's weird to me either way whatever it is a light nerf to jinx uh, it doesn't mean a ton um much like with the callista changes which ended up being uh callista got 0.25 ad growth in uh 0.8 uh in in 13.8 um her q and e have total ad ratios and she got about um like 0 0.6 0 0.7 percent win rate from that change um and that's a champion who by the way has really really high ad growth she went from 3.5 to 3.75 ad growth so that meant um that like the relative attack damage gain right like the relative growth of the champion um ends up being you know percentage wise like not quite as severe um and in jinx's case right uh right she starts below where where um callista was and, and goes even lower um her W has a total AD ratio here as well on the champion. Obviously, almost everything she does is an auto attack. Like, really, the only meaningful damage output that Jinx has is her R. Uh, that doesn't scale up her total AD. Um, so it, it has a pretty similar, um, like, kit magnitude compared to Callista. If you look at someone like uh, Zaya, for example, um, Zaya E is bonus AD, uh, but Zaya E is a meaningful part of her damage output. Um, and so, like, someone like Zaya will be affected less by this stat change than someone like Jinx, where um, pretty much every meaningful output cares about her base attack damage as well. Uh, same with Callista, where every meaningful part of her damage output, except the W passive, um, cares about her, her base attack damage as well. So um, expectation is that this is going to be a relatively similar size change to Callista, where, um, yeah, it's, it's you know, 
between 0.5 and 0.75% win rate. Um, and that was the size of nerf we were targeting, was to lightly tap down Jinx, who I think probably um, fairly rests above 50% uh, because of popular low win rate champions. Um, and this puts her in about that spot. So there's your, your small nerf to Jinx. Um, this is intended. Uh, next, we have a change to Kale, which uh, actually was something that um, August had uh, basically built uh, much, much earlier in the year, uh, but we were waiting for uh, free time from VFX artists who were busy with other projects um, in order to redo the visuals on Kale Ultimate. So the big change here, I think it's actually really, really cool, is um, functionally, Divine Judgment has a very long cast time. Now, there's a cast time during which you can move, but it means that Kale presses R and then just does nothing for a second and a half except walking around, and then finally the, the, the damage comes out from the swords, then people are vulnerable for a little bit more time, she can start auto-attacking, and congratulations. Um, this is a change where the cast time is much shorter, it's 0.5 seconds, so it feels much more like a regular spell. Um, cast it, and then she's off to the races. Um, and so this is obviously a big feels upgrade, and is going to, uh, it does take some getting used to, by the way, as someone who's played Desert Kale a few times with these changes, um, it takes getting used to the fact that I can auto-attack during the R. Um, there's probably going to be some day one win rate loss that's going to go back up, because seriously, it takes more than a game to remember that you can auto-attack during the ultimate, uh, because I spent a lot of time playing Kale, I'm like, I ulted, I'm just going to run around for a bit. It's like, no, 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 just swing at people. Um, that actually does matter. Um, the other part is the fact that um, the swords fall at a very different time as well. This also takes learning to get used to. Um, that um, now there's just a one one flat static duration of everything. Um, it's a half second cast time, and then at two and a half seconds, invulnerability ends and the damage comes out. Instead of at one and a half seconds, the damage comes out. Then at two, two and a half or three, the invulnerability drops. Um, and and so, like, I'm a really big fan of syncing up these numbers. I, I always like when these things can can line up better. I think this is a good thing. That is a better thing. That is a positive thing. Uh, I'm glad that is happening. Um, I think that is very good. I think it's wise. I'm again just yes. This is this is the thing to do. Um, and, and then, hey, by the way, the air effect radius is now much, much larger. It scales off of what is functionally Chaos Auto Attack range. Um, the damage is slightly lower, sure. The invulnerability is slightly lower at rank 3, although it is longer at rank 1. Uh, the damage comes out later, sure, but it covers a much larger area. But the big thing is Kale can auto attack one second sooner is a very, very big deal. Um, and so this is overall uh, pretty much strictly a buff. Because, again, level 6 through 10... Um, is a more meaningful part of the game than levels 16 through 18, which are not always even landed. This is strictly a buff. Um, this is obviously strictly a buff. This is obviously strictly a buff. This is obviously strictly a buff. Um, okay, there are two very, very light nerfs. Um, so, Kale, who already wins a pretty good amount of games, needs one more nerf functionally, right? And so it's like, hey, um, we're going to go back on the on-hit AP ratio on the E. Um, it was just a simple way to get some win rate back that wasn't going to be multiple lines of changes. Um, this is what August was stressing about, was just like, he just really wanted to be, like as few lines as possible to make it read less aggressively negative to Kale players. Um, and then, hey, it's just a tweak on the wave damage here. I actually like decoupling this from the E. I think it's actually correct to do so. It's, um, it, yeah, I can, I can understand the thematic, like, um, similarity or overlap between Kale's E rank up, which is passive on hit damage, and her level 11 plus uh, wave damage, which is a pretty similar mechanic and what happens, right? Auto attack and damage comes out, but decoupling it allows um, sort of just the freedom to tune this as needed, which I think is actually really, really positive. Uh, I think it's actually a good thing overall. I'm glad this is happening. Um, it's actually worth noting that um, data indicates that Q max is actually correct on Kale. Um, that the the heavily increased slow and heavily increased wave curve is actually really really valuable and now that um you don't you know care as much about getting rank 5 of e by level 11 when the waves turn on um then you can even further be like yeah we're just gonna max q here it's gonna be the wave clear tool and you know i'm still gonna get 20 damage out of e no matter what i put into or 20 damage of the passive no matter what points i put into q now again it would have still been rank 3 at level 11 uh but still I, again, I just like decoupling it. I think it is wise. I think it's a good thing. So I'm glad it's happening. Um, so let's talk about the numbers and go into it. So uh, here is Kale's E damage before and after. Uh, this is just simply the, the bonus damage on hit from, from the E. Uh, this is assuming, again, uh, the same numbers I had earlier with, with uh, Nico, which was um, 24 to 313 AP. It's just, my, it's just my default sort of numbers here for this. Um, but yeah, you know, it's down some, obviously, right? She's going to lose some single threat DPS. Okay, sure. Um, here's the amount of damage the passive deals before and after. This is uh, with the ability power ratio, which, by the way, is staying at 0.25. Uh, 
Um, and it's down a little bit, but like not a, not a huge amount. Like certainly this matters, right? Because you're going to double hit people, right? Um, you're going to go from doing 78 plus 78 to 70 plus 63. Like this is not trivial. Your single target DPS is down in cases where you have finally built up the five autos to get the waves going. Because um, your first four autos, right, don't have the waves. Um, so, it, you know, it takes a second to get there. But um, hey, you get to eventually late game and it's, and it's more. But yeah, it, you know, I, I'm under no uncertain circumstances. This is, this is, of course, a nerf. But again, it's meant to be a nerf because the ultimate got stronger. Um, and let's talk about the ultimate getting stronger. So not only is the AoE much larger and you have a second auto attack. Uh, well, actually, we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, so here is the, the damage of the R itself. And the damage is not actually that far apart, but the big thing is um, the radius is massively, massively larger. This covers a lot more screen space. And that is a very, very big deal. Um, seriously, uh, getting getting a you know giant freaking nuke on a frontliner, your Vi or Wukong goes and dives in, you pop this on them. Um, yeah, sure, at you know, rank three, the durability, the, the yeah, duration of this is not quite as long, but the radius is gigantic. The damage is still very, very high. Um, it's it's going to be good. This is this is like it's less damage hitting way more people, and that is a really big deal. Um, so even though rank three is is weaker, uh, the radius jumps up another hundred points and is a very big deal. Um, so the next thing though is that you get one extra second to attack with, and so this is um, not counting. Um, other sources of damage, like this is not counting um, Nashra's Tooth, giving you um, even more damage on hit, uh, but this is basically her base AD. Um, this is this is her base AD. This is an approximation of how much ability power she's going to have. Um, this is, you know, her character level giving her attack speed growth um, and her passive being on. But again, we're not counting um, Nashra's Tooth, giving you more attack speed by itself. We're not counting Nashra's Tooth, giving you more on hit damage by itself. Um, but, you know, we're doing an okay-ish approximation here and it's like, oh, by the way, um, in one second, I'm going to do about 98 damage, uh, at, at level six as a character. And by the way, level six, the ultimate, keep in mind, right? It barely loses damage, uh, and the vulnerability duration is actually up. Uh, so, hey, uh, this is a, a really hard strict buff. Okay, well, 11 through 15, the damage is actually down in the ultimate, despite, despite the ratio being up. Well, okay, well, my damage is looking like this. Um, I'm actually doing really, really good damage. Uh, we've caught back up on the passive scaling over here. Um, we've got a good amount of ability power. And yeah, it turns out that um, I can do 270 damage um, in one second uh, by just getting to attack for that amount of time. And hey, we go to rank three, the ability where uh, we get even more radius, but we lose even more damage. And don't worry, we're getting um, more and more damage to the passive, more and more damage to everything else. And oh, I can do up to 300 damage. Um, you know, during this one second, uh, which by the way makes up for it entirely, right? Um, if if the ult didn't get more radius and hit exactly people every single time, you would still do more damage by doing this instead. This is not counting, by the way, the passive AOE hitting more than one person, which it's going to in many cases. This is not, again, counting actually with on hit, which is something that she's going to buy literally every single game and going to get value out of that one. Um, like, th this is, this is definitely a buff just to like make clear that like no really this really does matter quite a bit uh, this is about how much damage he's getting uh, probably slightly under counting uh, again I'm not counting Nashers but I'm also uh, to be fair also giving her um, a free full stacked passive which is not always going to be true either so again a little bit of give and take but um, directionally accurate to what's going on here where uh, you know this versus this plus this is your damage difference right uh, pretty meaningful stuff Scion, a very light touch. Um, this is basically a follow-up from durability update and item updates to tanks for a while. So uh, this is just very lightly increasing the amount of health decay during his passive. Um, keep in mind that this is the baseline number and this number gets multiplied by, uh, I forget, just some multiplier every single like second that he's still alive during his, his undeath phase. Uh, and basically the reason it's just a flat increase is, hey, um, we think it's correct that Scion passive lives longer when he stacks health. That is, that is the whole intent of the interaction of the kit, is that he literally gets to delay death via life-stealing well, via getting more health on him by lasting with his W passive, by getting heart steal stacks, by getting grasp stacks, by building other health items. Um, that's an intended um, interaction there, so it's not a percent health drop. It's, it's, it's meant to be that you can kind of intentionally delay this by building in a certain way. That, that's, that's, again, an intended choice. Um, but because heart steel now exists, because the durability update happened, and people just have more health flat up outright, um, hey, Scion passive has not kept up with those changes. And yeah, it would be free if it was percent health based. Because hey, guess what? It would automatically update with changes. But again, it is intentionally not a health ratio, so that building and buying health and stacking health, um, you know, makes this not last as long, or, or sorry, makes this decay not as important early on, which is intentionally so, and so just a very small change, but hey, a small nerf to Scion. Next is Swain getting a pretty big bump to his Q. Um, 
Swain support is definitely in a really bad spot. He's definitely not very strong. Of course, Swain bot is quite good. Swain mid is totally fine. Um, I think these are still Quotinas. I'm always, of course, a fan of clean numbers. So, hey, 38% ability power being 40% ability power, 8% um, being 10% AP. I just kind of like it. Uh, you know, that, that's always neat for me. I'm always a fan there. Uh, but anyway, it's just more damage on his Q. We can do the numbers themselves right here. This is if you only ever hit um, one single bolt, the damage before and after is uh, mostly increased in the base damage. Uh, and then a little bit, you know, through the AP ratio, it trends down towards 4%, uh, but still, of course, a damage increase. And then if you hit every single bolt, it's 16% more damage early game. So uh, a lot of damage into melee. I mean, these are, this is some really, really heavy nuking um, if you're able to land it. So pretty big deal here. Um, yeah, it's going to be a buff, um, especially towards the early game, the early levels. His all-in power is going to be up there. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is strong, right? Swain, Swain's going to be looking pretty good. Um, after this patch, and I'm probably going to dust off the bot lane Swain, make sure I, you know, get rid of the rust, and um, it's going to be an elo clan mechanism, because, yeah, I'm pretty sure bot lane Swain is going to be real, real strong. Um, if it ever does catch on the way that Vagar bot lane caught on, probably have to do some work to uh, separate Swain bot from mid and try to get that one back, but uh, for now, win me some games, I guess, why not? Uh, but yeah, I did, I'm not the one who put in the changes, but um, hey, uh, I, in general, again, especially if bot Swain does not end up being a problem, and again, for the most part, mages in the bottom lane are uh, quite rare and don't tend to create big problems that eh, it's probably okay for a while. Just, um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I, I do wonder how much of, uh, bot lane mage win rate is, uh, solo queue team comps are bad. It's pretty easy to have AD top, AD mid, AD jungle, right? Kiana and Zed and Yasuo and Yone are all very popular champions. Um, Jace, right? Uh, and, and Wukong Vi and whatnot in, in the jungle. So, um, it's, it's pretty easy to have a bad comp. I actually wonder how much of that is, is, reflected in the solo queue win rate um i'm actually of the opinion as well that um top lane and jungle tanks should probably like in a fair game have elevated win rates in solo queue because it's it's really hard to have a garbage team comp if you have a nautilus or a scion or a malphite in it um because at least you can engage a team fight um, or a Sejuani for jungle, right? Um, it is very easy to have a bad team, uh, a bad team comp that's like, well, we have to win lane or we lose the game instantly. And it's like, oh yeah, we're playing Jace, Elise, Ari, um, Ash Karma. And like, I'm pretty sure I've seen that comp in pro. And it's like, if you do not win the game instantly, okay, Ash at least can throw arrow out. Um, Zeri, Lulu. And you just can't engage team fights. And it's like, well, I hope, I hope we can walk at them when they set up for Drake. I hope we took the lane control beforehand so that we got set up for Drake instead of having to engage into us. Hope so. Otherwise, we can't get picks. Um, and, and I just wonder, like, how much of that actually is Malphite and Scion and all these champions and Orin just deserve to be 52% because it means that you didn't enter the team comp by picking them. Um, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, it, it, it's it's the same situation that we're in with, with AD carries complaining that mages exist in their lane, which is that, like, I don't know, a lot of things are viable, and it's like, okay, top lane fighters hate when there are things that aren't fighters that are good. Like, I, I still believe that Malphite wasn't that overpowered, or even very overpowered at all. It's just like, well, still, his two most common matchups when Malphite was peak win rate were Jace and Jax. Which means more often than not, he is played as a counter. And then, like, the number three and number five most popular matchups for Malphite were the ones that countered him. But, like, one, two, and three were Malphite favored, which means... More often than not, Malphite is counterpicking you and, you know, have other champions maybe. Like, it, it, it it's it's the uh, the other adage is like, um, nerf paper, uh, it's like nerf paper buff rock scissors is fine, quoted to rock. And it's like, you know, maybe just you're, you're biased. Um, and not that, again, Malphite couldn't have been overtuned or anything, but just that that always tends to be somewhat true uh where i i feel like you you dig into player complaints and it's like actually this is fine you're just getting countered by this and and you know so it's like fighter players are offended that things that aren't fighters are good in their lane marks uh bot laners are offended or ad carry players are offended when um bot laners that aren't ad carries are good um and this is also sort of attached to um the idea of ad carry players feeling like um they never get enough peel and that like it, it's impossible to play ad carry especially in lore and mars people don't peel for you and it's like oh well if set is just a viable bot laner or karthus is a viable bot laner and you're like my team won't peel for me i saw this team comp and it's like we've got a Zareth down in the support uh we've got wukong in the jungle and our mid laner is i don't know ari or something and it's like they picked zed like well 
there are no marksmen that don't die in these team fights. Play Swain. Okay, maybe not in the Ari Zareth team comp. I hinted that one for you a little bit, but like, play set, maybe, right? Like, what, what about some champions that don't die to assassins that you should be willing to play? Like, personally, I really like playing a really varied suite of champions. Um, now, I've been playing League for 14 years, and so I actually really, really like sort of breadth as an option. But um, I don't know. I think I think a lot of complaints around, oh, I can't play my role, my teammates don't help me, or, you know, whatever. It's just like, if people had a more open mind on average of like, yeah, as a Jax player... I'm totally willing to flex this to my jungler and just pick Rumble or Silas into this Malphite and go win my lane really, really hard. Or as a bot laner, I see they took Zed mid and I'm like, oh, you know, it's a Swain angle. It's a Karthus angle. It doesn't matter if he tries to assassinate me. I either naturally buy Zonias or I don't care about dying. Um, Croit, cool. Let's do it. Why not? Um, I don't know. To me, that is that is actually a a richer experience in playing League of Legends. Personally, like I would, I would rather we be in a world where players are way, way, way more willing to play... Um, more types of champions in their lane. And this might not be how most players think. Most players might just want a very specific play style in their League of Legends. And it's like, no, I only want to play fighters. No, I only want to play marksmen. No, I only want to play whatever. And this is as a guy who, like, I pick Archer in every fantasy RPG ever. Like, that is the type, that is the type of champion I play. Um, it's it's Bow League in, in Path of Exile. It's, it's I, my first character was a Ranger in Dungeons & Dragons, 5th uh, edition, which, unlucky, Rangers in 5e suck. Um, but, like, that's always that's always been me. Um, but personally, as a, again, a very, very long time league player, I really enjoy the, the breadth of it. And yeah, I'm currently one tricking Senna as support. I'm playing more marksman, by the way. Um, but like, I, I enjoy the breadth. I don't know. Either way, thought process here. About Swain in the bot lane. He can be good. What a tangent. Let's move on. Talia is getting a really, really nice change. I like this a lot. Um, Talia cast lockout is now um, whenever she takes damage, not when she deals damage. So she does not break her R while wave clearing um, I think that is a very good change. I'm glad they're doing it. Good stuff. Um, no, she can't double cast R to get away if you start harassing her. Um, she does have some some room to like, oh, the gank is coming. Quick, double cast R and get out when she's middle of wave clearing. There is some power in that where she can double cast R and just GTFO before the gank lands. Um, that, that's going to exist, but um, still, cool. Trundle is getting some some good updates. I'm, I'm very, very glad with this change. I think this is, this is very wise. I think this is actually quite good as well. Um, yeah, level one attack speed. This is what base attack speed means. This is, not, this is not his attack speed ratio. This is not how hard he scales with bonus AS or his W or buying a dagger or character levels or anything. This is his level one attacks per second um, with everything else under the hood being identical to before. Uh, and his level one mana is up. These are meant to be uh, somewhat top lane focused. The, the mana change especially is going to be top lane focused. I think this is going to be a pretty big jungle change for his clear speed. Uh, keep in mind, of course, again, that every jungler gets some level of free DPS through uh, their pet dealing some damage. But as Trundle is mostly an AD champion, uh, AD ratios on the pet are really, really, really low. Um, if he is to go for Sunfire and do more health stuff, then okay, more of that damage is going to come from the pet. But ultimately, this is going to be felt um, pretty hard, especially in his first clear. And again, the mana is going to be quite quite nice for his actual top lane play. So here's one of the attacks per second before and after. Um, this is without W on. This is with W on. You can see... Uh, that, you know, with how powerful W is, the amount of attack speed it gives, uh, the the difference is much less meaningful late game. But this is still a really, really, really big deal. I want to once again call out that when Zai gets much more attack speed, uh, this ended up being like 2.5% win rate. Um, now, Trundle does a lot more than just simply auto attack, but um, this is a pretty big deal. I think he will really, really feel this. Trundle may be... Um, I think there's a really good chance that Trundle is an S-tier pick next patch, especially in jungle. Um, in top lane, of course, he's still going to feel this. He can fight for the wave a bit better. He can scrap with enemy top laners just as well. He's going to have 10% more DPS while fighting them. Um, certainly, you're still only getting one Q every time. You're only getting one R every time um, for those kinds of trades. But uh, still, your auto DPS is going to be quite nice. And even with W on, it's still uh, pretty meaningfully uh, up there as well. Uh, as far as his mana pool is concerned, quite a bit higher. Um, I actually personally would have liked to see his mana growth go down to kind of just hit the same equilibrium at level 18, maybe even a little bit lower. Um, but basically alleviating his early mana constraints helps because it means he is um, able to cast more spells in the lane. He gets, you know, two or three more chomps something, and that's really, really useful for him. So directionally, I think there's really cool changes. Um, I think just especially for feels, this needs to happen. Um, this maybe could have been slightly lower or something. This could have been 0.65 or 0.625 or something. Um, the only concern I have is that this change is a little bit jungle skewed. And uh, at least that's my belief. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, and that his jungle is okay. His top lane is what's bad. Um, this is definitely a top lane focus buff. You're not going to feel this in the jungle at all. Uh, and this one is maybe jungle skewed, but we'll see. I think it's still some good changes overall for Trondle. Volibear getting some pretty light touches, but the health ratios are up. Um, I looked at Volibear's most common builds, and it's basically full tank. It's um, Iceborne Gauntlet into Holebreaker into 
uh, like or, or Frozen Heart uh, than Hullbreaker, Thornmail, Visage, like those are the items. And so aside from Hullbreaker with his 50 attack damage, um, he's really just building full tank stuff. So I think it's actually really cool that we're seeing health ratio stuff here. So bonus health um, here on how much damage the W deals, um, as well as some uh, missing health stuff here. I personally, actually, since Volibear is um, functional, well, so Volibear is kind of right now between Juggernaut and Diver. He's Diver because he presses R and suddenly the tower is off and guess what? He's dove your backline, but he's also not really that good at killing whatever the backliner is because the ult's kind of slow. Like, yeah, he can Q in and deal some damage, but he doesn't, he doesn't do Vi levels of lockdown, right? Like, Vi and Wukong are absolutely Divers where they're actually probably going to kill and stick on that backliner. Camille, another example of this, where it's like, no, they're really going to reach you. But Olivia are kind of less so. He doesn't reach quite as far. And so he's, he's kind of between these two worlds and... Um, I haven't given this much thought, but I feel like the right direction for Volibear is to kind of pick one and go for it. Um, this is kind of a random aside, but um, if he's building full tank, uh, which is what his current kind of build is, uh, that's really skewing Juggernaut, right? That's that that's skewing, I'm on the front line, I'm big front line guy, I'm going to land multiple Ws on you, I'm getting my E-Shield back up, I'm you know meant to stack up my pass to get the lightning going. Like, a lot of the pieces of that kit are very Juggernaut, and it seems to be that people who have stuck with Volibear and are playing Volibear are doing the Juggernaut types of things more. Um, maybe this is because they have to. Again, I haven't given a lot of thought to Volibear, but that is my sort of first thought about the champion and maybe directionally where he, he might go in the future. Uh, again, unsure, but um, as it is, he is currently building um, very tanky, and any gold-based output is going to be a little bit more skewed towards top lane than jungle. Top, uh, over the course of time, will earn more gold than jungler will in general. Um, also, this is actually going to scale with his total HP, um, functionally, since um, it's, I mean, sort of, right? Like, once he gets enough missing health and he would have crossed by whatever would have been him dying, um, hey, this comes back up and you can, you know, heal for more health overall. So let's talk about how much is going to happen to Volibear. So here is the amount of damage that W is going to deal, uh, assuming we're getting to about 70 bonus AD, which is, like, basically, um, like, stat shards or gathering storm or, like, infernal drakes and a hole breaker. Um, it's just, I didn't want to scale to 50 AD by level 18. It's like, I don't know, something's going to kick in at some point. Uh, you get a Baron buff once in a while. You get Infernal Drake uh, at some at some points in time. You know, if you chose Drone Rotter Walking or Gathering Storm for some reason, you know, you get a little bit of AD somewhere or whatever. But again, it's like plus 50 AD, like around like here, I think, is what Holberg is doing for you. Um, and either way, uh, and of course, again, there, there's an assumption of bonus HP. 1600 bonus HP, by the way, is actually what his full build gives him. Um, the like most common item in each slot adds up to 1610, I think it is, um, bonus HP. Um, uh, and either way, like, hey, here's the numbers. Here's what you get. Here's your here's your math. Um, you have 600 bonus HP. Congratulations. Here's your stuff. And uh, yeah, you do a bit more damage overall. Uh, not by a ton, but the the bonus health ratio going from 5% to 6% gives you this much damage. And uh, yeah, it, it's a light touch, but it's something and it's there. And it's going to scale with the amount of gold you get. Um, this is assuming you are at 50% health when you get your W heal to go. There was a flat value. There was a missing health value. The missing health value is what went up. Um, the, amount of he's, he, the amount that he is healing is up pretty substantially. Now, it's worth noting that technically this... Um, um, yeah, because the percentage is higher, it's just simply, right, 7 becomes 8, 13 becomes 16. Um, and so, yeah, if you're at half health and you pop this, of course, the flat value is unchanged. The, it's like 20 to 80 or something based on ranked. Um, but this is the amount that you're getting before and after, and it's quite nice. It's a pretty meaningful healing increase. So, yeah, Volibear uh, can sit on frontline much better, right? The buffs are sort of towards the Juggernaut build. It's towards a, a very durable sit in frontline, you know, multiple Ws in the same target. Uh, that's the way it's going, which I think is probably correct. And happy to see it. So cool busts to Volibear that are hopefully very, very lightly top lane skewed. Uh, finally, a change to Lich Bane. It's just plus 10 ability power. Not a lot to talk about here. I think it's glad. Uh, I am glad. I think it's good that this item is getting buffed. Um, definitely is in kind of a weak spot. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of these items trending toward 100 ability power. I think it's just um, just very easy to be like, yep, every mage item has 100 AP. And, um, you know, we can kind of balance the unique passives and whether stats are around them. But, it, you know, you get this like sort of obvious baseline level of power and everything. Um, I did a video a really, really long time ago before I joined as a game designer about wanting you know, a baseline amount of attack damage on every single AD item in the game, every single AD crit item. And I was really happy when Phantom Dancer got two long swords in it because, you know, getting 20, 20, 25 attack damage in every single slot helps make sure that your character always progresses in a way that, you know, their, their, their abilities still scale when you buy the next item. Um, so I'm, you know, generally not a huge fan of just pure AS items, um, unless it really makes sense, uh, for the shape of the item overall. Uh, and again, in a similar lane, uh, I would like all the ability power items have a good amount of ability power so that that number consistently increases and feels good for mages and um it's it's the next in a, in a pretty long line of of mage item buffs throughout the year um which is i think pretty cool 
uh, you know, they're, they're very lightly getting tapped up every single time, which is, I think, cool, and, and good that we're going in this direction. Lichbane getting 10 ability power. I didn't bother doing any, like, math stuff for the gold efficiency, because gold efficiency is a little bit of a fake stat. Um, and at the end of the day, it's a bit better item. That's kind of a good thing. Um, you know, efficiency goes up means more and more users are going to be more willing to try to branch out to that instead and, and move in that direction. Uh, these are not really balance changes, but the expanded emote wheel. So now you kind of separately point out where you're going to auto spam for the start of the game, for an ace, for victory, for first blood. But now you have an, uh, a nice, look at this, nine point emote wheel uh, upgraded from five. It's a big dub. It's pretty great. I love spamming some emotes, so that's a good change. Some ARM changes here as well. Not a lot to talk about. Clash coming up here. Um, all fun stuff. Uh, some behavioral systems updates. So in-game reporting, you can now report during the course of the match. You can update the report during the game as well. That's cool. Uh, mute options are in a new panel. that can be accessed through the scoreboard just below the report button. And then there's a mute all and self-mute control uh, next to your own champ portrait and summoner spell. So you can do that from outside the scoreboard, which is kind of cool stuff. Uh, bug fixes and QL changes. Is there anything here from me that I don't remember? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of VO stuff. Um, I remember there's a lot of VO changes that uh, were not in... Um, this is a weird bug with Etherwisp um, coding items. So uh, here's a random thing. So the way items are coded, um, there are a lot of stats that are like just stats. Um, so it's like, hey, if I want to give um, Infinity Edge um, additive crit damage, there is a stat drop down for that. And I can just write in 0.35 uh, and it can just give me the stat crit damage. But if I want the... If I want um, Infinity Edge's crit damage to be locked behind getting enough crit chance, as it is in the current live version of the game, uh, then I have to put it in the script, and I have to like define it as a variable, and then in the script say if you have more than this much crit chance, now give yourself the stat. And of course it's not a stat, now it's just a variable that's 0.35 that's then you know defined and done stuff in script. Um, an item like Etherwisp, uh, depending on how it's coded, and I'm pretty sure I know what this is, is... Um, Etherwisp, instead of it being a stat on the item, it probably gave it to you as a buff, as, as in it gave you the smooth speed like in the script itself. Um, and it's possible for lots of weird things to happen where um, some some buffs, like uh, so many times we give you a buff that you, we expect to be infinite. Uh, we give it to you for 25,000 seconds, which is going to be longer than any game of League of Legends, doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure this is what happened here. I'm just going to say like, hey, this could have been what happened. This could be how other things happened. This is actually what, what um, Zaya's Q animation bug was is um, it's very easy to overlook a flag because it's, it's hidden in a weird menu. This is something that we would like to fix about our tools and we're, we're working on it, um, is that um, some buffs do not persist on death. And many times it's intentional. It's like, hey, I put, I, I like dealt damage. I, you have red buff. Um, when you die, I want your red buff to go away. That's like a very intended interaction that your red buff disappears when you die. When you have Baron buff, it disappears when you die. Uh, it doesn't just come back when you come back up, you know, 40 seconds later because there's still two minutes of the buff left. Um, it's entirely possible for Etherwisp to have given you a 25 second long buff when you bought it and said, okay, it gives you, I have an Etherwisp buff that's giving me, that's invisible, it's hidden, it, it exists though, and it lasts for seven hours, um, but when I die, it cleanses the buff. Um, now, if I were to sell and undo the item, it would put the buff back on me, because when I sell the item, it gets rid of the buff. Um, but now, you know, I have to do that to get my moves speed back, right? Like, that would be one possible way this would have this broken. Um, now, a way to fix that is to make Etherwisp a unique item. You aren't allowed to hold more than one Etherwisp. Now, it could be a base stat, right? There's lots of ways you can kind of do that, but... Um, Anyway, random stuff like that is interesting to talk about with how things can work sometimes. Um, looks like there's not too much to talk about here, so that's all fine. Let's go ahead and, and go to the top. TLDR patch 13.9. Not a huge one, but some fun stuff to talk about uh, with several buffs and nerfs. The biggest thing here is the Nico Midscope update is really, really, really cool. You can disguise as a non-epic monster, a minion, a trap, a ward, or a plant. And, oh man, it is really cool. You can do some really fun stuff with this one. Um, follow Elise into a gank as a spiderling. All kinds of weird stuff. It's it's really, really quite awesome. It's really, really cool. Um, this is great. This is really fun to play with. Um, overall, some other changes going on with uh, damage going down, but AP ratio going up. Uh, jungle damage up on the Q. Jungle damage up on the W. Damage going down, AP ratio going up on the E. Uh, damage going down, AP ratio going down on the R. Uh, no shield, but it's got a knock up before the stun. Overall, uh, this is a really cool champion. Members tweaks, I think, are fine no matter what. Uh, but I think it's going to be really exciting, really, really fun. Uh, there's going to be some. There's going to be a lot of fun chaos. I really recommend um, play some games with friends. Don't ban it. Get Nikos in there. It's going to be cool stuff. Atok getting some very late, uh, very light late game skewed buffs via the passive damage going up. This, don't, don't, don't um, sleep on this because this is a very meaningful amount of increased damage. Um, this, this is uh, actually pretty solid here in terms of how much more damage it's dealing. Uh, this is a decent amount of move speed here as well. So uh, you know, not the gigantic 
most gigantic buffs ever. Aatrox is going to be 70% win rate for most MMRs, but uh, good that he's going in the right direction of getting buffs and getting buffs and getting buffs and getting to a better spot for most players at home. Mumu getting some early game focused um, jungle buffs overall. Um, mathematically, as long as you are maxing W last, this is a strict buff to a Mumu at pretty much all points in time, uh, especially in the early game where it's the same percent health damage, but it's just simply 8 DPS higher uh, from your first target. Um, and then by the end of the game, when you're maxing it out um, at level uh, 14, 15, 17, 18, uh, the percent damage makes up enough for the uh, rank up damage loss that you're still going to do more damage overall uh, against virtually every single target, which is uh, cool stuff for a Mumu. Uh, next is Belveth, who's getting more damage on uh, Q to monsters. This is going to be a pretty solid damage increase. It's around, I think, like 14% uh, more damage to monsters. A little bit less attack damage growth, which is fine. It's, it's um, you know, not that much win rate loss overall. Um, and uh, just going to make the first jungle clear feel better, but not try to move her win rate too much overall as a champion, because she's not in a bad spot. Just the first jungle clear feels pretty bad. Uh, Jinx is going to be a very light tap down. Um, going to be, you know, between like 0 0.5, 0 0.75% win rate. Um, very light tap down to Jinx, who is above 50% win rate. A little bit too strong, and so getting a very light tap. Nothing much to talk about here. Uh, Kale getting a pretty cool change. Um, big update to the R. You have one full extra second of DPS time as you're not locked in your cast frames anymore. Effect rate is massively higher. Invulnerability duration increased at rank 1, decreased at rank 3. Um, the swords come down later and deal less damage, but the fact that um, the radius is, is bigger, uh, generally I think is going to make up for the damage difference. And the extra one second of cast time, or the extra one second of, of free time, time to go deal DPS um, is a lot of power, and it's why there is a light nerf here to the E and a light nerf here to the late game passive. I think it's overall, though, really cool changes to Kale. Uh, there is a learning curve, learning the new attack timings with the fact that you press R and you're able to auto-attack right away, uh, the fact that the swords land so much later, the fact that your rank 1 ultimate lasts so much longer. Um, takes a while to get used to. Uh, I'm generally a fan of uh, durations not scaling with rank. It helps their learnability overall, so I'm actually directionally a really big fan of this change. Uh, and overall, I think these are good changes to Kale. Scion gets a little bit more a health decay during his passive. Ultimately, there's just a lot more health in the game overall, with things like Heartsteel being really good, uh, and the durability of giving everyone more health growth overall. So, uh, Light Nerf to Scion, but he's going to be quite good. Swain getting a meaningful damage increase onto his Q. I uh, want to point out mathematically, this is a bigger increase to um, his base damages than it is to his AP ratios uh, overall. So, uh, this is an early game focused Swain buff. I think he's going to be um, really, really, really good uh, in early game trading. And uh, his like all in power is going to be a little bit higher. And this is just really strong. Swain's going to be in a very, very strong spot, I think, post patch. And one thing to point out, actually, is the fact that the, the damage is more in his bases than in his ratios uh, makes it very lightly support skewed, which um, this was kind of a lot of the driving reason was like mid Swain is okay-ish, uh, but support swing is quite bad while still relatively popular, and so uh, very lightly support skewed on the buff, so of course affecting all his rolls because it's just strictly more damage. Uh, very nice change to Talia, getting uh, the R to not lock out when you deal damage, which feels really good for a lot of Talia players. Doesn't mean that she has the ability to random escape by double casting R backwards if she's the gank coming, even if she's in the middle of wave clearing, but I think still overall good change to Talia. She's going to feel really good with this. Trundle getting a really massive attack speed buff at level 1, and a pretty meaningful amount of increased mana here as well. Uh, we'll feel the mana costs change a lot for top lane. We'll feel them a, uh, a moderate amount for top lane. Uh, we'll feel the attack speed a lot in the jungle. Um, overall, though, quite big buffs. I think Trundle's going to be very, very good in the jungle next patch. Bolivar getting a bonus health scaling increase on the on the damage on his W, and a uh, missing health um, scaling in increased... Um, on the R, uh, sorry, on the R, what? Uh, health, missing health increase on the W here as well. So pretty substantial buffs um, to our boy Volibear. Um, good stuff for him. I think these these buffs will very lightly skew top lane where he's going to get a little bit more XP overall um, uh, and, and gold overall, which is going to sort of factor into the fact that this, hey, this is scaling off of how many levels he has um, since this is going to care about his base stats as well uh, and as well as how many... Um, uh, like how much gold he spends on getting more items. So I think pretty positive stuff overall. 10 AP to Lich Bane, you know, not much to talk about here, but some, certainly a good change overall. So happy to see that one happen. And as a, a buff to Lich Bane, underperforming item, good stuff there. That's it for the patch rundown. Thanks for watching. Bye, everyone.